Uh, Lord, there are people in this community that, that pastor other churches. Uh, godly men. Godly men. Men who have given their life completely to you. And Lord, it's a, it's a thankless job sometimes. It's a lonely job sometimes. But these are tremendous men of God that absolutely love you and want nothing more than to see your kingdom come in their lifetime. And so, Lord, they're going to get up tomorrow morning and they're going to preach their hearts out. And they will have studied and they will have prepared and they will have prayed and they will have researched. Lord, all that is for nothing, as it is with me, if your spirit is not guiding my words. If your spirit is not in the words I say, in the look of my eye, in the inflection of my voice, whatever it is, Lord, it must be driven by your spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that the power that only you have would be in the words that they speak tomorrow morning so that there would be much profit in their churches, that the name of Jesus would be lifted high. And it's in his good name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Well, if you have a Bible, why don't you go ahead and grab one. Don't cheat yourself. Don't just trust me. You have a Bible. It's God's word. It's right there with you. Um, if you don't have one, there's orange and yellow ones there around you, and you can go ahead and, and reference those. The, uh, the page number for most of the scripture that we'll read are going to be up on the screen-ish, if you know what I mean. Uh, you know, sometimes I mess it up, but I try my best. Um, but anyway, we, while you're going and picking up your Bible, hey, baby, how's she doing? Good, 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 good. Hey, Isabella. Hi. Hi, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we've been studying the last, what is it, three weeks now. We've been doing this series. Daddy's got a sport coat on. Woo! Look out. Um, you see what happens when you get baptized? Now he means business now, man. He means business. Um, so anyway, we've been studying the last three weeks. We're doing this series called Church 316. And we've been studying the 316s of the Bible because inside the 316 is a clear path for the church. It's, it's who the church is and how we should conduct ourselves here in this earth. And so what we did is we, we started out just kind of getting you back up to speed for those that weren't here. We started out by examining really God in the 316s first because he's the one who said he's going to build the church and he wants to get you involved. And you're like, well, if you want me to get in on this thing, it's not a part-time gig. He's really calling us 100%. He wants us all in, right? I mean, let's face it. He doesn't want any part-time, lukewarm people. He wants people all in, right? Anyone? Come on now. If you hear something you like, you can holler out. It's cool, right? No one will yell at you. I don't have a tie on. So, so, so when he calls us to this thing, you, first and foremost, you want to know, if, is this God? Is this Jesus who says, I'm going to build my church? Is he worthwhile following? Because if he's calling to a full-time gig and you want to like pour all your resources into it, before you go all in on something, you want to know. It's like, uh, it's even more so, but if you were going to like marry someone right now, like you'd want to know a little bit about them, right? You don't want to like give yourself completely to them unless you know a little bit something about it. You don't want to take a job unless you find out a little bit about the company. They don't want to hire you unless you give them a resume so they know a little bit about you. So, so, so if you're going to go all in on this church thing, you need to know who this God is. And so we, we spent a f the first week talking about God. We know that he loves us. You know that he loves us because he, because how much does he love us? So much. Oh, you guys are getting it. It only took three weeks. That's good. That's good. He loves us so much that he's, and it's, and it's not just reserved for mama, right? It's not just reserved for mama. It's he loves everybody so much, right? That he sends his son. So we know that he, he loves us so much that he's compassionate because his love spurred him on to do something to help our great need. And so he sends his monogenous, his unique one, his one and only Jesus Christ the Lord. So we know that he loves us. And we also know that he loves us because he sees us. See, when, we, when our kids want to, 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 to know that we love them, what do they say? Daddy, Mommy, watch my dance routine. Daddy, Mommy, watch this. Look, look, look. It drives you crazy, right? Let's admit it. It drives you insane. But it's their way of knowing that you love them if you'll take the time to actually engage with them, right? Because if you're staring through someone, you know they don't give a rip about you. 
But if you pay attention, and we see in the scriptures that he's actively seeing, he's seeking, he's hearing the praises of his people, he's hearing the prayer, he's hearing the cry of his people, and so we, we know that he hears, we know that he knows everything that's going on, we also know that he acts on our behalf, but it's for his own namesake. So he's protecting his own, his own, um, his own reputation, he's protecting his own name, and that's kind of comforting to us because he's going to hook us up to make him look good. So that's good, so it's not based on your performance, which a lot of religion will teach you, that if you'll do this or you'll do that, if you'll stop doing this, then God will approve of you. Then God will love you, and that's not the way it works. He does stuff for you to protect his name's sake. All the Just breathe. <sighs> right? That's good. So that's him. And he says, if the Lord is God... Follow him. So if we establish these as knowing, seeing, loving God who wants to hook you up in all areas, you know he's awesome. So he's like, listen, if you know I'm God, don't, ha don't waver between two opinions. Follow me. And what is his mandate? Go build my church. So he's, that's what he's doing. You know, when you were working all week, guess what Jesus was doing? I don't know what you were doing, but he was building his church. That's what he was doing. He was, he was actively pursuing people. So he could, he could seek and save that which was lost at the fall. All that was broken and fractured. He's trying to fix it. That's what he's been doing all week long while you were at work. While you were on vacation, whatever you were doing, Jesus was hot pursuit like Roscoe P. Coltrane's hot pursuit of people. Goo, goo, goo. That's what he was doing. I think I heard it from heaven. Goo, 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 goo. That's what he did. And so he calls us into the church, full-time gig. His spirit is in you. Now go tell people. And so we established that the second week that, that, the, that the church is the oasis of life. That, that he pours himself, his spirit into you. And, 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 and rivers of living water, which is his spirit, are flowing into you. And then you flow into the rest of the community so they might know and love Jesus. And so what does he say? He said, everybody can come. There'll be plenty for everyone. Go dig ditches in the desert because I'm fixing to fill them with water. That's what he said. So we have to create spaces for God to work. There's a space right there. The building right here is a space. Any group that time, when we meet, that's a space. Anytime we reach out into the community, it's a space. It's a place where God can work. And that's what we're to do. We're supposed to dig ditches so he could fill them with water. So we're an oasis in the community. We also found out that we're supposed to be high impact. We also said that, we're, that, that the people that are God's people, the real church, are the ones who are what? On, thinking of ways to honor his name always. And that's a big word, right? That's a big word. There's a lot of part-timers out there. Yeah, you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Really, you don't, you don't seem like it at all, but you say that you are. And what he's looking for, what he's really looking for, and he says in the very next verse, I want to say it was in Jeremiah, he said, those are my people. The people that are always thinking of ways to honor my name. When I wake up, that's what I'm thinking about. When I'm at work, that's what I'm thinking about. When I'm at dinner, that's what I'm thinking about. When I'm with my buddies, when I'm at church, when I'm at the gym, when I'm at the golf course, when I'm in bed at night, and maybe keeping me up at night because I'm always thinking of ways to honor his name, to see the kingdom come. The, the king's glory is a growing population, right? And so that's what you're thinking of all the time. How can I take what he's given me and leverage that thing so more people can know him and more people can worship him? That's what we're supposed to be doing all the time. He says, those are my people. Those are my people. So that's where we kind of left off. I did three weeks in five minutes. Mm. Crazy. If Jared was here, you know I'd hear it right now. So tonight's going to be a little bit different. Tonight, I'm really not going to teach you a whole lot about Jesus. That sounds crazy, right? But what, really, what I want to do tonight is a little bit different. I want to talk about this church that God established. He establishes a church. So almost five years ago, he establishes this church. It was SNL Church, you know, the billboard the, over at the UMAC there in, in Tavares. And here we are now, almost five years later. We're, we're here. He establishes the church. It was because of him. He inspired us to do it. It was all for him. Everything's great. Super. But what I want to talk about tonight is, is our identity and, and really like a, a, um, like a positional maintenance. What I mean by that is, is it, he started the church, and, and here we are, but how do we, how do we stay the course? 
What's, what's the best way to stay the course, to stay on track? That's really what I want to talk to you, not, to, to you tonight about. Um, I think there's some great examples of what I'm talking about. They're not good examples. Well, they're, they're, they're clear examples, but they're not good examples. I'd like to uh, direct your attention to the book of Revelation. You won't see it up there on the screen, but I want you to be thinking about that. You don't even have to look it up, but in Revelation, there's, there's seven churches that Jesus is talking to in red ink, okay? It's, it's him, up, 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 Jesus talking. And he's talking about churches that were his. These are churches just like ours, started, inspired by him, motivated by him, all because of him, do it for him, do it for him, do it for him. And so he's talking to these churches. When I talk about positional maintenance, I'm talking about how do we stick in there? How do we stay the course? Because this church is in here. You read it, and he's like, um, yeah, I know all the things that you do. And he goes on to, when he's listing these churches, he's like, yeah, you did this good, you do that good, you do this good. And he starts naming all these things that are good. You know, you kept the faith, you worked hard, you persevered, you did this, you did that, you did right. But it's this sharp rebuke. I'm going to just cover three of them. The church in Ephesus, Sardis, and Laodicea. And I'm not going to tell you what, you can read it, and I would recommend that you do. I mean, don't just listen to me, but like go home and read the, the first three chapters of Revelation. And, and it, it'll tell you that, that the church in Ephesus first, they, they started out right, and they were, they were rocking it, right? People were getting saved, and people were getting baptized, and, and the word was getting out, and the word of God was flourishing, and, and it was awesome, right? Ministry everywhere. But then what it says is that they kind of got off track. And, and what, ha- what he called it was that you, you kind of fell out of love with me. You know, you, you lost your first love, you know? And so, like, you used to be on track. You were rocking with me, but then you kind of went sideways. And so, so this is what he says. This is what Jesus says to him. He says, look how far you've fallen, Look how far you've fallen. He tells him, here's his instruction. Repent, or I will remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. He's like, don't make me come down there. I'll stop this car right now. You know what I'm saying? That's what we would say. Like, he's like, listen, listen, you, you you were part of my gang, but listen, you got off track. And if you don't get back on it, I'm you're out of here, buddy. You're out of here. So here's here's the next one. Here's the church in Sardis. Same thing. I'm not going to describe what they did. You can read it. I hope that you will. They were starting out good, and all of a sudden, erp, sideways. Got off track again, right? They got off track. So what does he say? He says, go back to what you heard and believed at first. Go back to what you heard and believed at first and hold to it firmly. Like, once you get there, don't let go. Don't keep messing up. Get back on track with me. Repent, get back on track. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again If you don't wake up, like if you don't do this, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Now, if that's not, that's scary, but if it's not scary enough, if you go down to verse 5, it says that those who actually hold on and are victorious to the end, the ones who do it right, I won't erase their names from the book of life, but I will present them to my father and his angels and say, they're mine. You see, see so, so, so we don't want to be that church, right? That we're, if there's an eraser available, I, I'm hoping I'm wrong, but it says something about erasing names out of the book of life, and I don't want to be that church. So here's another one, uh, Laodicea. This is a, a famous church in Revelation. Many of you have probably heard it. It's the lukewarm church. You ever hear them talk about that? Preachers talking about the lukewarm church. It's the church that's, that's like, uh, yeah, are you a Christian? Yeah, I kind of am. Like, I don't read my Bible or nothing. Like, I don't pray, and I don't give, and I don't serve, and I don't ever tell anyone about Jesus, but I believe. Like, it's the kind, it's the kind of guy or the gal that's just kind of sort of. Do you, know what I mean? you know a lot of people like that, right? You don't have to raise your hand because some of you might be sitting in this room. I don't want to condemn you. But, 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 but that's the kind of people that he's talking about. He's like, yeah, you're kind of lukewarm. You, you, you say you're in, but you're kind of not, you know? And so this is, this is what it says in that book. It says, uh, Jesus says, you say you are rich and I got everything I need. But he goes, no, but you're wretched and poor and blind and naked. It almost sounds to me like this is the church that bought into the prosperity gospel of wanting God's stuff but not wanting him, right? So that's, 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 that's what I see there. And he's like, no, 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 you're not rich 
you might have a lot of money, <laughs> but, but you ain't nothing. You're blind and wretched. And I don't know if that's the way that Jesus describes a saved soul. But I just know that it's kind of a sharp rebuke. And I don't want to be that kind of church. So the question is, really, when you look at these examples, the question is, how will revolution assure its position as a church of Jesus Christ while also ensuring the progress? Remember last week in Philippians 3.16, it says, make sure you hold on to the progress that you've made. Progress is good. I will what? Build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, right? He wants it to grow. It's his ecclesia. It's his gathered people, his his congregation. His congregation just isn't in this walls. His congregation is across the globe and it's growing and that's his desire. And he wants it to make progress. So how do we assure our position as a church where he doesn't say, uh, you know, church there in Eustace, I know all you do, but I got this complaint against you. See, I don't want that. Does anyone want that? I don't want that. I don't want that. So, so how do we assure that position and ensure progress? And I think that it's all wrapped up right here. I want to I welcome you to, to grab one of these things right here. You see them on your table? Gra grab one of those things right there. Take a look at it. Take a look at it. What does it say? What's the, what's the first thing it says? Read the top line. Is a what? Right. The first thing is gospel-centered. See, that, that, my friends, that is the way we will assure our position as a church of Jesus Christ and ensure progress for the kingdom of God. If we will stay gospel-centered, if Jesus Christ, and I, I don't want to even say that he's at the center of everything, he is the all and all of everything that we think and do and say. Everything is about Jesus Christ. You know what's really weird is that of all the things that churches can do, there's one benchmark that a church must have to assure its position. And this might sound crazy to you, but that benchmark is Jesus. It's, it's Jesus, really. It's the church of Jesus Christ. See, churches, sometimes they get off course. They get off course. Uh, you know, their teaching gets off course. The Bible says that that's going to happen, that there's going to be a, a day that people don't want the preacher to get up and preach this book to them, that they want to just gather teachers around them that are going to tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear, that they're not going to listen to sound doctrine. They won't listen to it. And so we know that churches do that. They get off course in their teaching. They get off course on their attention and their focus. They get off course on their effort, what they're doing. They get off course with their resources. Eustace, I know all that you do, but I got to complain against you. And I don't want to be that church. I don't want to be that church, right? All right. Now, let's just go right here, right now. One of the reasons why we get off course, it's a big reason, is because we want to be smart. Do you ever notice that some of the, the high intellectual people of this world, you know, the university types, they have a hard time with Jesus. Did you notice that? You know some of the major awesome universities in this country, like Harvard and Yale, they were Christian colleges. Do you guys know this, right? But as time goes on, people aren't satisfied with the simplicity of a God who said, earth, and there was one. See, they can't, gra they can't grasp it because they get test tubes and Bunsen burners. And they're ripping pigs and frogs apart. They want to know how this thing was made more than just Mars. Water. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they, the simplicity. And then the simplicity of the gospel that says, you are wretched and I love you, so I'll save you. Like they can't get, they can't wrap their brains around that. Our desire to know stuff is insatiable. This, this desire to, this almost unquenchable desire to know stuff, to learn, to grow. It's just who we are. We want, we want truth and we want knowledge and we want understanding and we want wisdom. We want all these things. We need to know stuff. You know why I know this? Ask me why I know this. Let me tell you why I know this. As of right now, each month, Google, if you want a company, if you want to see someone that's knocking it out of the park in what they do, I'm not saying that they do it like it's a good thing. I'm just saying if you want to see success, like pick something to do and do it really well, Google. They do 100 billion searches a month worldwide. 100, no one's even in awe. Like, yeah, I got that. No one's floored right there, huh? That's just no big deal. 100 billion 
billion searches a month. You know what that means? That's three, what's that? Yeah, that's what I wanted to hear. These guys are knocking this thing out of the park. That's really good. What's, of course. That means 3.3 billion in every itty bitty little 24 hour period. Just today, just today. 3.3 billion Google searches. People want to know stuff. They want to know stuff. And so, now why does this matter for the church? We're talking about the church, right? If we're a group of people that are immersed in a society that's desperately seeking to know stuff, right? They're looking for stuff. They want to know uh, information. It's the, it's the information age. You've got this thing. Wish, who's got a phone? Like, everything's right there. It's crazy, right? It's crazy dangerous. Everything is right there in this little piece of plastic. The whole world, it's the information age. And everyone has these things, and we're looking up to get, to, to look up movie times and directions and, and recipes and sports facts and, and schedules and airplanes and, and how to do this and how to do that and who, who did this on that date. I mean, just, just countless, endless, a hundred billion searches every single month. So why does it even matter for the church? Well, we're a group of people that are immersed in this culture, right? We're immersed in this culture. And so here's what the Bible says we ought to be. Because everyone's looking for this, right? They're looking for answers to life's big questions. So for, as I'm looking through the 316s, and 1 Timothy 316 is an awesome scripture, but I'm not going to really talk about it tonight. It just says that the great mystery of the faith is that God was revealed in a human body. Like, it's Jesus. So that's just part of my message tonight. It's all about Jesus. The whole church lives for Jesus. But that, as I was reading that, I saw 1 Timothy 315. I want to share this verse with you. I think it's up on the screen. It says that the church, us, Say us. Yeah. We, the church, we are the church of the living God. This is a free one, right? Jesus went to the cross and died, but he said, I'm going to build my church. And this thing here says he's alive. Amen. Okay. So we're the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. The pillar and foundation of truth. So, so, so what it's saying here is that, is that, that truth could be found right here. Right here with you. That, 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 the, that the truth of, who, of, of the universe is, is supported and carried and you are it. You are the foundation and the thing, the pillar that holds up everything else is on you guys right here, right here. And so what does that mean? That the church right here, Re Revolution Church should be the, the ultimate source of truth in Lake County right here. That's who we are. And what that means is we need to not be obnoxious, please don't be obnoxious, but be firm. If it's not the truth, don't believe in it. If he's not the Lord, don't follow him. But if he is the Lord, what? Follow him. So be firm in the truth. Don't say what's subjective. Well, I believe this, but you can believe that. No, it's the truth, you know why? Because it is. And so we have to believe what we say. We have to read this and believe that it is truly exclusive. It's the only truth. We are the ultimate truth of the entire golden triangle. Now what does this mean? Is it, is it pointing to a to the truth of what? Is it pointing to a topic? Is, uh, should, we, should we teach people how to view and manage money? Well, yes, we, we can do that. How about relationships? Can the church teach about relationships and help encourage strong relationships? I think so. Um, how about balancing work and, and family? Absolutely, right? Yeah, we can do that. Um, how about art? We could, how about art? We could, that's beautiful. How about art? That's beautiful. <laughs> so how about art? We could teach that, right? We teach creativity and, and nurture that, right? How about, <clears throat> how about this one? It's a big one. How about moral values? Absolutely, right? Absolutely, we can. But listen, that's not, what, that's not what it says. See, it says that we're the pillar and foundation of the truth. But let me tell you something. The, the, the truth is not pointing to a topic. The truth is pointing to a person. And Jesus said, I'm the way, I am the truth. Right? So all truth, whether it's no matter what the subject is, it all culminates in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the truth. He is the only way. 
Okay, so, so our main objective here at this church, and for those of you that might get bored of this and say, I need to go to another church to maybe find something deeper, something more, something different, this may be boring for you. But I'm telling you right now, as long as I can draw a breath, this church's main objective is to introduce people to Jesus and nurture their relationship with Jesus by teaching them what Jesus taught us. And, what, and teaching them about Jesus here in the Bible. Remember the Great Commission. What does he say? Go make disciples and teach them all that I have taught you. That's what we're supposed to do. So the church maintains its position as an authentic Christian church by introducing people to Jesus and then fertilizing that relationship so that it can grow and grow and grow. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, that Lena was going to build his church. Did he say that? Did he say that Katie was going to build his church? Who was going to build his church? He's going to build his church. He's going to build his church. So it has to be about him. It has to be, we need to talk about him, teach about him, introduce him to people, teach them all about Jesus so they can have a relationship with Jesus. So what do we do all the time? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's always going back to the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the gospel that begins the building process of the church because it's the power to save somebody. No, nothing else in all of creation can save anyone's soul except the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we refer back to the gospel all the time because it saves us. It's also this gospel that gives us the ability to, to, to love like we've never loved before because we have experienced a love from a creator who doesn't need to love us and we have certainly not earned it, but he loves us anyway. So when we experience his unconditional love, it's a lot easier for us to go ahead and pass that on to you because I let him down and he loves me. Well, you let me down, I can now find it easier to love you anyway, most of the time. No, I'm just kidding, all the time, all the time. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that allows us to forgive when we don't want to forgive. Because we, like I just said, it's kind of like love. We have so let him down in our actions and choices, but yet what does he choose to do? He chooses to love and, and show that in the forgiveness shown on the cross. And so when we reflect back and when we meditate on that, and we just let that marinate for a little while, we sit in that quiet spot and we think about the fact that I have so, so let you down but yet you love and forgive me anyway? Well, certainly I can extend that same grace and mercy to Ken. I can extend that same uh, to, to Beth. I can do the same thing to Jonathan. Like, I, maybe it's not easy, but I can do it. I've seen it done. You know what I'm saying? Like when, you, when you're growing up and, you, and your dad shows you how to uh, work on a motor, then you can learn, then you can work on the motor because you saw how it was done. And so it's the same thing with God. We see that evidence of love and forgiveness and compassion on the cross. That's the ultimate expression of love and forgiveness and compassion is on the cross. And when we glance back on the cross and we consider this Jesus, man, it just makes it so much easier to do what he's done for us and extend it to other people. So the church is, is it's built by Jesus. It's pastored by Jesus because the scriptures say, and it's so true, he's the great shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd. So what does that mean? He, he protects his flock. He's fighting for you right now because evil wants to steal, kill, and destroy you right now in your spot. If he could melt you into a ball of wax and have you like the wicked witch of the West, he would do that to you right now. But Jesus right now in the heavens, and you can't see it, but he's fighting for you right now. He's protecting you. He, he's, he's providing for you. That's what a shepherd does. He provides. You know that money you put in that plate? You didn't get it. You didn't, you, it's not some great talent of yours that you conjured up on your own to get this good job. You didn't have anything to do with your talent. He gave it to you. So he's the provider. He's the, that's what a good shepherd does. He, he protects you. He provides you for you. And then what does he do? He takes you into greener pastures so that you can flourish at a higher level and advance and grow flourishing. That's what a great shepherd does. He's the head of the body, the church. It's built on him. It relies on him. The, the, the scriptures say, what's up, my brother? You know I can't do this without you. Get your hiney in here. So, so, so everyone say hi to Andy. Okay. So, so it's about Jesus. Enough of you. Okay. So he used to have long hair. He looked like him, but not anymore. 
So, 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 so he's, the, he's the great shepherd. He's the cornerstone of the church. Peter's not the cornerstone of the church. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. That means he's the one who decided what our faith would be like, that, that he would be the one to trust, and it would be his desire to work through you to build his church. Like, this whole faith is decided by him. He's the perfecter of the faith. What that means is that when judgment comes, it's on his righteousness and his perfection. It's what gets you into glory nothing that you've done on your own he's the author and finisher of our faith and he's the good teacher and so we sit at his feet those of us that are wise will sit at his feet with this beautiful precious book this treasure and we will hear the good teacher speak when he opens his mouth we hear his words the deep life questions are all found in the truth they're all found in the truth the meaning of life Eternity, what is sin? What keeps us out of there? What is love? What gets us back in? (laughs) It's all found in the person of Jesus Christ. So that's truth. Well, what about this other stuff I talked to you about? Knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Why does that matter? Because everyone's looking for it. A hundred billion searches, right? A hundred billion people, uh, searches on Google looking for stuff, looking for knowledge, looking for understanding, wanting to understand how things work, learning, growing, just navi- trying to navigate through life with some level of success. That's all we're looking for, right? Come on now. I'm not the only one. I want, I want to do it. And so, so uh, what I said a moment ago, Jesus, he knows that the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, but he said, I want to help you navigate through life with success. I came that you might have life abundantly. He doesn't want you to just have a, a certain level of success down here. He wants you to have it up here by the rooftops. We sung it. He wants us to have an abundant life, a really, really tremendous life. And so you know what? This too, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, this too points to Jesus as well. And I want to explain what I mean by that because it's just a big claim. Scripture ascribes creation to the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ the Lord. So when the, when the Bible says that he spoke and there was the heavens and the earth, Paul in Colossians 1 says it was Jesus who spoke. And John, the apostle in the first chapter of John said the same thing. That nothing was created except through him. He is the creator of all things. So even knowledge, wisdom, and understanding put it back to Jesus, and I'll tell you why. Go to Proverbs 3.16. We're going to read a few verses there, though. Proverbs 3.16 through 20. We'll get you started anyway. Proverbs 3.16 through 20. Holler when you're there. And then we give grace to the rest. And here we go. Okay, so Proverbs 3.16 says, it's talking about wisdom. You can see that in the previous verses, but it says here, wisdom offers you long life in her right hand and riches and honor in her left hand. Now let me just ask you, like we're not the gospel, us, but when Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly, would you say that is synonymous to the life that's described here, a long life with riches and honor. Sounds pretty similar to me. Uh, To me, I read that and I'm like, he wants us to have a good life, right? He wants us to have a good life. Who wants the good life? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a lot of hands going up. That's good, that's good. We're all in agreement. We're all in one accord. Look at this, verse 17. She will, wisdom will guide you down delightful paths. Who wants a delightful path? Come on now, keep raising your hand. All her ways are satisfying. That's good. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. You ready for this one? This doesn't happen too often in the Bible, so embrace it when it happens. Happy are those who hold her tightly. Who wants to be happy? Come on now, right? I want to be happy. So uh, listen, I want to have a good life. I want to have a delightful past. I want to be satisfied. I want to have a happy life. So what do I need? I need some of this wisdom. I need some of this understanding. I need some of this, this know-how, this truth. I need, I need, to, I have, I need knowledge. And this all points back to Jesus. Look at the next couple of verses. What does it say? By one, wisdom, the Lord founded the earth. So we're talking about creation here now. Jesus Christ, the one who spoke it, and this is how he did it. He said he, he created by wisdom, the Lord founded the earth. By understanding that he created the heavens and by his knowledge, there's all three right there. The deep fountains of the earth burst forth and the dew settles beneath the night sky. Now, I don't know about you, but this 
floored me when I read this. So what this is telling us here is that the Lord, the one who spoke creation into existence, he wants to give you those tools. He wants to give you that. He wants you to go to him, the one who could do that, the one who could speak Jupiter into existence, and he wants to give you some of that stuff. You know what I'm saying? He wants to give you some of these abilities. Not maybe to speak planets. Don't ca catch me wrong here. But, but to give you the wisdom, to give you knowledge, to give you understanding. Proverbs 2.6, the page before, says that the Lord grants wisdom. You see what wisdom does. Wisdom created. Right? He, it says the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. You see, so again, just like the truth... You want the truth, what does it do? It points you to Jesus Christ. You want knowledge, Jesus. You want wisdom, Jesus. You want understanding, Jesus. And so everything we do should just be doing this. Point people back to Jesus. That's the best thing. You know, it's weird. People that don't know me, they think that I have my stuff together because I'm a pastor. And so, so they come to me for like counseling and stuff. And I'm not a counselor by any means. And I'm so terrible. I, I always have the same routine. I don't have any other way. I'm like, well, let's just see what the Bible says about it. Are you reading your Bible? That's my best. I'm like, I don't charge them per hour because it's probably not the best, you know, in detail response. But that's all I know. But I started to study this week and I realized that's actually pretty good advice. Point them back to Bible. Point them back to the scriptures. Point them back to Jesus because everything is about him. Everything is about him. So Colossians 2, 3 sums it up. In him lie all the treasures of wisdom and understanding. Everything. It's all in Jesus. So what are we supposed to do? I said this before. The greatest thing we could do to maintain our position as a church of Jesus Christ is always to point people back to Jesus, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because in him they will find truth, they will find wisdom, they will find knowledge, and they will find understanding. A hundred billion searches every month and all those answers are to be found in Jesus Christ, not in Google or that guy that was calling. See, I can go to Google. Let's just say I want to buy a car. I want to buy a new car, right? I want to buy a, I mentioned a Honda Accord a minute ago. Not that I want one. So I want to buy a BMW. And so what do I do? I can go, I can, I can go to Google and I can find out everything about a BMW. Like, you know what I'm saying? Makes, models, rebates, incentives, all the, the reports on them if they're good, um, pricing, colors, features, um, people's opinions, review. I mean, I can, you, you know, you can go online. You can get every, every spec of every car on the market. You know you can do that, right? Now, you can also go, we're Christians, and so we're supposed to be good stewards of our money. And so you can go online, too. You can go to Google, and you can, you can find out how to, to, to properly do a, like a budget, you know? And I think that's wise. That's wisdom, I think, to have a budget. And and, uh, and so we should do that. You can go online and you can get that information on how to put a budget together. But I can tell you one thing. I can tell you one thing that Google can't do. See, it can give you all the information that you want and give you all the facts. Should I buy that new car? I'm sure I don't know. Well, I'm sure I don't know. Should I buy that new car? Most and Meredith, I'm not sure what to say. See, that's, what, that's the only answer you're going to get. Because it's not the church of the living Google. See, it, we're the church of the living God. It's alive. And so he can actually, you can't go to Google to get wisdom. You might, get, you might go to Google to get facts. But you can't take the facts of, of the, the quality of the car and the price of the car and, and find out about budgeting and know in this specific situation at this time, should I buy that car? See, that's wisdom. That's taking all the facts and truth and knowledge and understanding and knowing how and when to use them for his greatest honor and your greatest blessing. That's wisdom and you can't get it from Google. 
But you can get it from Jesus Christ. You can go to him, and, he, and it's personal, and it's in these circumstances right now. See, you can buy a car right now. Maybe it's okay for you. You might make the same amount that I do and have the same budget I do, but maybe it's okay for you to buy the car right now, but maybe it's not okay for me to buy the car right now. And, and Google isn't going to answer that, right? There's no wisdom on there. There's wisdom in the living God who knows your circumstances. He sees your situation. He hears your prayers, and he responds when you ask. You want wisdom? you ask your father and he'll give it to you. That's what the scriptures say and that's a promise of God. Call him on it and wait and see. So the, 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 the understanding and the wisdom and the, and the knowledge that come from the mouth of the Lord. What comes out of the mouth of people? Out of, uh, not bad breath. What comes out of the mouth of people? No. Starts with W. Words. Words. We say stuff, right? <laughs> What'd you say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you sat up front. <laughs> so, so words come out of, out of the mouth of God, right? Well, where do you, you find words in two places. This is God's word. This is God's word. So you want to hear him talk? There it is right there. He'll talk. He'll talk, and we're going to talk about that in a second. He'll also talk when you pray, and you'll hear his voice. You get on your knees. And you'll hear his spirit speak to you. You might not hear it audibly, but you will know. You'll be led by the spirit of God, and he will give you wisdom in your situation. That's what he does. He speaks to you. I want to I share a scripture with you, 2 Timothy 3.16. Please go there. 2 Timothy 3.16, one of my favorite sections in all of scripture. It's precious to me. I hope it's precious to you. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding, right? From his mouth. 316. All scripture is inspired by God. Some versions will say God breathed, right? Right out of his mouth. And what comes out of his mouth? Words of knowledge and understanding. So, so if we want knowledge and understanding and we need answers to questions, where do you go? I guess my advice wasn't so bad. Go to your Bible. You want to hear God talk? Listen to this is what he does in the scriptures. We want what's wisdom? We got some facts. What do we do with it and when and how, right? Listen to this. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It's telling us right or wrong, what we should do and what we shouldn't. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses us. This is about, this is right here that sums it all up. What should I do, God? What should I do? Should I do this? Should I do that? What's the next verse? God uses his word to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So there's your answer. You want to know, should I do this right now? Go to the Word of God. Go to the Word of God and He'll tell you. Go to the Word of God and He'll tell you. So, what, do we, what does the ecclesia do when we gather? What should we do when we gather? Should we, should we I mean, because we're the people that are supposed to be always thinking about how to honor His name, right? That's who we're supposed to be. So do we talk about sports? Do we talk about health care? Do we talk about economics? Do we talk about social injustice? Politics? I don't think so. This is a gathering, Colossians 3.16. I want you to look at it. It tells us what we're supposed to do when we get together. We're supposed to look for wisdom and knowledge and understanding and truth in his word. He'll tell us what to do. And then when we get together, this is more Jesus. He's always stealing the spotlight. This is what he does. He's always stealing the spotlight. But he deserves it. Look at this gathering. Let the message about Christ in all its richness, fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom. Where did the wisdom come from? The word of God, didn't it? We just, we just read that, right? Comes out of his mouth. So what does it say when we get together? What are we supposed to do? Talk about sports? Talk about the, talk about the Buffalo Bills? It's been a long time, brother. Not as long as it's been since you won, but... Teach and count. See, I'm already going against my, my teaching here, right? Not supposed to be talking about sports. Forgive me, forgive me Father. Forgive him. <laughs> Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that Jesus gives you. 
Right? Let the message about Jesus in all his richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God. That's what we just did. With thankful hearts, we had thanks. We had thanksgiving in our heart. We sang and we gave. And whatever you do, whatever you say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. Man, everything's about Jesus. Everything's about Jesus. It's amazing to me. And, and so that's what we do when we get together. We, we, we teach about Jesus, and we, and we teach what Jesus taught and read. It's right there. He said, do it this way. Do it that way. Don't do it this way. If you're best interested at heart, do it this way. Because I want you to flourish. I want you to have an abundant life. And if you do it my way, it's going to be the best way. Do it all about him. And why do we use the script? Why is the word of God, just like everything else I've talked about tonight, point to Jesus? Well, he said to the religious leaders, you search day and night, looking through all this stuff, looking for something. And all the while, it doesn't even matter what they were looking for. They were looking for eternal life. But it doesn't matter what they were looking for. But what does he say about this stuff? It all points to me. Every bit of it points to him. Everything, the church's very existence, should point people to Jesus Christ the Lord. That's our only objective. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we teach, every outreach we do, every meal we feed, every person we touch should be to point them to Jesus Christ where all truth and understanding and knowledge and wisdom are found. Can someone say amen? Amen. amen. Now you can really say amen. I'm done. It's good to be loved. Oh, okay. You realize this is all I do, right? So let me just run with it, you know? Just let me go for two or three hours. So, like I said before, I'm not gonna, I didn't want to teach a whole lot about Jesus tonight, but I, what I wanted to do was point you and me and us, like he's been doing the whole night, right there. Point us to Jesus. I don't want to teach a whole lot about Jesus tonight, but I really wanted to exalt him. I wanted to place him in his proper position so that we can maintain our proper position as a church of Jesus Christ on his mission to build his kingdom. And that's what we should be doing all the time. So this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to take some time and I'd like to pray with you. That's what I'd like to do. And I don't want to rush. I want to pray. And I, have, I would like to lead you in prayer, and our prayer should be to point to Jesus in everything. And that's it. That's what I want to do for the next, I don't know how long. So I'm going to ask you to just do this. Get comfortable. Snuggle into that seat. And this is crazy. Take your, your eyes off the Word of God. Take your eyes off of me, please. Dim the lights down. I don't want anyone to see me or anything up here, nothing. And I want to spend some time and I want to pray with you. And, and I want our prayer to, to put Jesus in his proper place. We get done praying, folks. We're going to have another opportunity to sing to him. And tell him how wonderful he is. Really, that's what we're here for. Lord God, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being the only true God. Lord, we want to thank you for being the God that sees into the minute details of our life. The one who is actively seeking hearts to strengthen. Looking to strengthen those whose hearts are completely committed to you. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God that sees and hears our prayers. Man, I've said this before, and I, I, I really enjoy going back here, really. I don't know why. The world wouldn't think that crying is a pleasant thing, but some of the best times any of us have ever had, Lord, with you is when we were soaking the carpet with our tears. And it's good to know that when we do that, that you're listening. It's good to know, Lord, that you see us and that you hear us. It's good to know that you love us so much that you have compassion. 
Thank you, Lord, that you're not like us too often when we just simply say, I'll pray for you and don't, and don't act. Lord, you're a God who saw our greatest need and sent the only fix. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you showed such great love by sending your son to die for us while we were sinners. That we didn't need to somehow clean up our act to get your approval. Our approval was established eons before when you decided to make us, you decided to love us. Lord, I thank you for those of us that have accepted your free gift of eternal life. I thank you, Lord, that your single act on the cross was the only thing needed to cover every sin in our life for every person who's ever lived and that nothing more is needed. Thank you for that amazing salvation. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us, myself included, to live a life that is worthy of this salvation. To live a life that displays the thanksgiving of our heart. To not consider you lightly. To not treat this forgiveness as common but to be the person that your scriptures talk about where it says that we would be a people that are always thinking of ways to honor you because we want to be your people we don't want our names erased from the book of life we want you to to take us under your arm and march us right into the gates of heaven and present us to your father and to all of his angels and say, this one's mine. Lord, I thank you. I was probably, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, I don't even know, when you spoke into my life and said, do this thing. I thank you for establishing this church. And I'm unashamed of saying I thank you for the love you've given me for you and your word. And I thank you for holding on to me. And I thank you for bringing other people around me, starting with my beautiful wife and all these beautiful people here that have that same passion for you. They love your word. They love you. They love each other. They love the unlovable. That, are, that love to be generous. They love to serve. They love to dream big dreams. They love to create like you create. They love to love like you love. They love to forgive the way you forgive. To love to be compassionate the way you're compassionate. I thank you for these things. Lord, I thank you that every person in this church that has ever said yes to you, that has ever bowed the knee and, and, and said yes to, to your son, I thank you, Lord, for every single person that's ever graced this tub and was baptized. I thank you for every child you've brought here. I thank you, Lord, for all the incredible gifts and talents and abilities that you've brought in to this church family. And Lord, I pray, oh Lord, I pray, as I'm sure all of us are right now, that you'd really help us to use those gifts as they were truly intended. That is to bring glory and honor to your name, period. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to be led by you. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us here at this church more meaning than a Rotary Club or a Kiwanis Club or a Country Club. You've given us purpose given us meaning you've given us something to do you've you've, you've, you've asked us 
to be your agents of reconciliation across the earth. You said that you would make your plea through us. And I can't think of another purpose that would be greater than that. Lord, I thank you for being a tremendous shepherd for us all these years. There's been people that have come and go and we grieve the loss of them, whether they've gone on into their grave or they've gone on to another place to live or gone on to another church. There are people that have left us and we grieve. But there's one, there's one, there's one who's never left, the great shepherd. A great shepherd never leaves his flock and you have always been there to provide all that we needed. And we're calling on you to do it again, Lord. But from your glorious, unlimited resources, give us the inner strength by your spirit to do the work we've been called to here at Revolution Church. To truly look across our landscape and see all that is broken and say no more to the status quo. To change the way things are done here. To change the way lives are lived here. To change the perspective of people here in Eustis, in a city that is usually down in the dumps. Just don't have a lot to, to brag about. But Lord, would you change that? Would you change that through us? Would you let us be an oasis of life for this city so everyone could come who was thirsty and they could drink and drink deep from the rivers of living water? Thank you, Lord, for providing for us always, for protecting us. Lord, for praying for us, for pleading for us, for leading us to greener pastures where we could flourish and bring blessing to our city and to our families. I'm reminded, Lord, I would like to refresh everyone's memory, Lord, you said in your word that, that you would bless us, but not that it would end there, that you would bless us, that we might be a blessing to other people. So Lord, put that at the forefront of our minds day to day. And in view of your mercy, even though we don't deserve to be part of this family, in view of your mercy, Lord, I pray that you'll empower us and help us to stay in the fight to be a player in this game, to be a true player in this game, to push back darkness and bring light into this city. Lord, I thank you for being a God that allows us to ask you when we need wisdom and that you'd speak to us in our personal situation, in the circumstances of our own lives right here, right now, that you would speak life into those individual situations. We thank you for the word of God that we can always look into to teach us what we should and shouldn't do, to teach us what's right and what's wrong in our lives and to equip us to do every good work you've called us to do. Help us, Lord, to be gospel-centered always. Help us to not be a church that ever gets off course in our teaching, in our resources, in our focus, and in our effort. Help us to always stay focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Much like Paul, when he said, I came to you, I forgot all things except Christ on the cross and him crucified. Lord, thank you for letting us share Jesus with people. Thank you for the privilege of being able to pray to you and praise you. Thank you for the, for the joy that there is in obeying you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you for being the cornerstone of Revolution Church. Thank you for being the pastor here at this church and the hope of this church. Now to you, all glory in this church forever and ever. Amen.